using a songbook for a song this morning is going to be number 105. He is in our midst. Draw from the springs of salvation, give thanks to his great and holy name. Make known his deeds among the people, make known his exalted way. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for this morning. We recognize who you are, that you are the creator of this earth, and you made us, and that you keep everything that moves in motion. And Father, we just thank you that we have the privilege to be your children, and we have the privilege to be here this morning and worship you. And Father, we pray you be with us as we do that this morning, that we um, focus our minds and our hearts on you and um, block out the other things that are going on in our lives and just recognize that you're our God, that Jesus is King and that we serve you. And that because of that, we don't have to fear the world and don't have to be anxious and that we can have peace and joy that comes through being your children. And Father, we, um, we just thank you for everyone that is here and we continue to pray that we, we have a real uh, desire and a real effort to to help one another, to become closer to one another, and, and to try to be the family that you've designed for us. Um, Father, we we pray that as a group that we continue to to teach the truth, that we have the right heart in doing that, and that affects other people. We we pray you continue to to be with the efforts that are going on in that way, the individual Bible studies and. Uh, the gospel meeting that's approaching, and we just pray that you make that a fruitful thing. We know that we have a part of that and that you expect us to, um, to strive in that, but we know that you're the one that gives the increase. Um, Father, we just thank you so much for who you are, for your plan, for Jesus and his life, and the fact that he loves us so much that he was willing to die and that he gave us that example. Uh, we pray we continue to be more like him every day and um, that we worship you accordingly this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Number 23, unto thee, O Lord. <laughs> Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Bye. 
297, What the Lord Has Done in Me. Good to be with you this morning. It's good to have you here. This morning our lesson is going to come from Revelation chapter 3, the first six verses. Jesus is addressing the seven churches of Asia, and we have come to the fifth church, and this is the church at Sardis. Let's go ahead and read the paragraph, and then go back and notice some things about it. If you are looking at a paragraph heading or a chapter heading in your Bible, most likely it says something about to the dead church. And this is how Jesus describes the church of Sardis. And um, it is quite possibly the shortest address that he makes to the seven churches. And the idea is like, well, it's dead. What are we possibly going to get from it? And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Not very uplifting, not very positive. In fact, he really has nothing positive to say about it, that there's a few who have not defiled themselves. We'll talk about those in a minute. But to all the previous churches, he has had at least some word of encouragement here and there. But now he's talking to a dead church. Sardis was the ancient capital of the kingdom of Lydia. It, like Thyatira, is a prosperous industrial center in the region. And Christ describes himself, or the writer describes Christ as talking to them, as one having authority. He speaks with the seven spirits of God. That is the perfect, complete spirit of God that he has described as being before the throne. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches that he holds in his hand. We've talked about those angels as being representative spirits of each of the, of the churches. And this is what enables him to say, I know your works. I know exactly what the deal is in Sardis. I know what it is in Ephesus, Thyatira, Pergamos. I know what's going on in every single one of my churches. And he still knows what's going on in every single one of his churches. And that is something that he says to all seven of these churches. And therefore, it's something that he wants us to remember. And thus, I talk about it every time. Jesus wants us to know that he knows what's going on with his congregation. He knows about us. He knows our works. He knows our good points. And he knows our not so good points. He is aware and walking in the seven, amidst the seven golden lampstands, he's telling us that he is here in our midst as well. And so we need to ever be conscious of that. His appeal to his authority and his perfect knowledge is relevant to what he's about to say to the church at Sardis. He says, you have a name that you are alive. That is, Sardis has a reputation of being a live congregation. They look like they're alive. They look like a good congregation. Others look at them like they're alive. In fact, they come together every week and they think that they're alive. But Jesus says, you're dead. And that ought to grab our attention. That ought to, to get us thinking. Because... We think we're alive, right? Other people look at this congregation and think it's alive. But what does Jesus think? What does he see when he looks at us? What does he know about us? To Sardis, he says, yeah, you have a reputation. You, you think you're alive. Others think you're alive, but you're dead. Jesus, with complete authority and perfect knowledge, says you are dead. Despite appearances, despite what others think about them, despite what they think about themselves, they're dead. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. They look like they're alive. Okay? So, could we say that they might look like us? They might look like any congregation we've ever been a part of but they're dead, and they don't know it. They're dead, and they don't know it. Jesus has nothing good to say about them. As I said before, in verse 4, it says, there are a few individuals who have not become dead. In verse 4, it says, you have a few names, a few people, even in Sardis, a dead congregation. You have a few names, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And again, this isn't an unusual thing. It's very common to have congregations that aren't living up to Christ's standards, yet have people that are aware of that. And they, they would love to do something about it, and perhaps, perhaps they're even trying to do something about it, but nobody because they're dead. They look like they're alive, but they're dead. And Jesus says, those individuals will walk with me in white. 
The church at Sardis, you're dead. You're not going to walk with me. But there are some there who have not yet defiled their garments. They're not dead. They'll walk with me in white. And when we read that, I think we need to be impressed with two types of responsibility. I fully believe that we share a corporate responsibility to God. That is, our responsibility to God as individuals makes us responsible to the congregation of which we're a part. I cannot just show up here week after week after week and think, well, I'm good. I have to do my best to help the whole congregation be good before God. And Jesus is saying to these churches, he says, look, you know, I'll come and I'll remove your lampstand. I'll take it out of its place. I'll put an end to that congregation. Here he says to Sardis, I'll come upon you like a thief. A thief comes and takes what you have. And you're not going to know when I do it. We have to understand, collectively, we have to understand that we at Old Wire Road have a corporate responsibility. We have a joint responsibility. God calls upon us all to work together to make this a true congregation of Christ, to make it what he wants us to be. And if, if we're not going to all, every single one of us, contribute to that responsibility, contribute to the congregation in being what God wants us to be, then what are you doing here? If you're not here with that goal and that objective, why are you a part of this congregation? Whenever it comes to group dynamics, whether it's in a classroom, when I was teaching at the college, it was a very, very focused community group that we had in the cabinet and furniture technology department. Everybody contributed. But every once in a while, you would get a student that would come in, and all they were was a taker. All they were there for is for what they could get out of it. And the same is true for congregations. The members of a congregation have a responsibility. Everybody needs to contribute. They need to give. They need to add to that congregation. But from time to time, we can slip into the taker mode, right? Or we'll have members, or they're not, I mean, their, their name may be on the roster, Right? They may show up week after week, but are they really members of the congregation? Because they come and they take, and they take, and they take, and they contribute nothing. And that's not what we're supposed to be, and that's not what we're supposed to do. If you're going to be a member of this congregation, you have to have the conviction, the attitude, the determination that we're all in this together, and we all need to work together to make this the best congregation that we can possibly make it for God. That's our collective responsibility. And we all need to hold one another accountable to that conviction. That's what being a part of a congregation is all about and entails. God has us assemble so that we can help one another get to heaven, not so that we can come and be served. We are to come and to serve. There were a few in Sardis that understood that. And Jesus says, they shall walk with me in white. He says, there are some things which remain. He tells them to strengthen the things which remain, things which are ready to die. He says, you're a dead congregation, and whatever you've got left is ready to die. So again, I ask, what is... Jesus see when he looks at us. I once heard a preacher compare a congregation to a plant, right? When you look at a plant, that plant is only one of two things. It's either growing or it's dead. Think about that. If a plant is not growing, it's dead. 
And you could probably say that, I'm no whiz at biology, but you could probably say that of any living organism. I mean, we're all growing in the sense that our, our cells are reproducing, right? Our, our organs are functioning, you know? I mean, even Danny's grown, he just looks dead, right? But the idea is that growing or dead, and that's true for a congregation, if we're not growing, we're dead. What do we see when we look at us? Okay, we talk about personal, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But the idea, you look in the mirror, okay, what do you see? I look in the mirror, you will look marvelous, right? I look in the mirror, it's like, man, I'm getting gray hair. And Shirley says, what do you mean getting? I look in the mirror, and I think, I'm getting ugly. I was looking at, I mean, my, my skin's turning into crepe paper. Right? It's like, Shirley says, this is what happens when you get old. But when we look in the mirror, when we, when we look at, at ourselves, how do we see ourselves before God? Pulling their own in the congregation. What do we see when we look at ourselves? What do we see when we look at this congregation? Well, when I look at this congregation, one of the first things I see is I see a bunch of I love tremendously. I see a bunch of be with. Okay? But is that all God expects a congregation to be? Do I see a congregation that is truly and consistently at work in being what God wants us to be? Do I see a congregation who takes responsibility for itself in trusting in God and doing what he wants us to do to fulfill his purpose? Is that what you see? Or do we just see a bunch of people that we can be happy with and have a good time with? I mean, that's a wonderful thing to see, but God calls us to more than that. Are we growing or are we dead without even knowing it. Sardis was dead, and they didn't even know it. They had a name. They had a reputation like they were alive. Jesus says, yeah, but here's the real deal. You're dead. So, are we growing or are we dead? Are we growing in determination? Are we growing in conviction? Are we growing in desire to work for the Lord? Are we growing in effort? Are we growing in spirit, in knowledge, in truth? Are we growing in love for one another? Are we growing in unity and peace and harmony? Are we growing in a unity that cannot be split apart? Are we growing a heart of service? Are we growing in godly influence? Influence among ourselves and with one another? Influence in our community? Influence at school, at work, in our neighborhood? Are we growing in letting our light shine? When we teach somebody the gospel, it's a wonderful thing. But are you, as a member of this congregation, growing in your ability to influence them in godly behavior, to stay faithful? There have been people that we have taught the gospel to that have been in and out of the congregation. And some of them have drifted away, and I, I wonder if maybe it was because of a lack of influence from other Christians, a lack of a godly influence, a lack of relationship. Are we growing in our relationships? Are we growing in number? 
Are we growing in glorifying God? Are we growing in a true recognition of our purpose? And as a congregation, just as individuals, we have a purpose. There's a work that God is wanting us to engage in. Are we growing or do we just look like we're alive? Do we just have a name that we're alive or are we dead? That's the introspection that we need to engage in, both on a collective level as well as an individual level. When I look in the mirror, am I a more mature Christian today than I was last year? Am I faithful today than I was last year? Am I better spiritually today than I was last year? Or am I just content to just kind of roll along without any real improvement spiritually? I mean, we think of improvement in so many different ways. We think of improvement in weight loss. We think of improvement in, oh, I've changed my diet and I eat healthier. We think of improvement in the fact that, oh, well, we exercise you know, on a regular basis. We think of improvement in that. I, I, I read, you know, I read a book a week now, right? We think of improvement and we measure it in so many different ways. But do we ever think of spiritual improvement? Do we think of godly improvement? And I am doing more for God and his kingdom today than I was doing last year. I am being more of an influence, a godly influence in my family, in my community, in my congregation than I was last year. I am, I am serving people more than I was a year ago. Do we measure those things? Do we measure that kind of growth? I am fulfilling God's purpose for my life. I am more conscious of that, dedicated to that, cognizant of that than I was last year. God has given each and every one of us a purpose individually. He has given this congregation a purpose collectively. Are we doing a better job of fulfilling that purpose today than we were last month? That's growing. And that's what God calls upon us to do. In verses 2 through 3, Jesus gives us, and Sardis, a warning and some advice. In verses 2 and 3 of Revelation chapter 3, he says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. The first thing he says is be watchful. And that word actually said be awake. Right? Arise. Be alive is what he's telling them. Look, you're dead, and you need to come to life. You need to be awake. It is not too late for Sardis because Jesus hasn't come upon them to come. Tyra, I'll take your lampstand away. I'll come upon you like a thief, and you won't know when it's going to happen. And when he's saying to be watchful, he's telling us we can choose to be dead or alive. We can choose to remain stagnant or we can choose to grow. And you know what? It's so much easier for us to choose to grow when we have others right there to help us and to cheer us on and to encourage us. This is why God has us assembled. This is why congregations exist. Because it's so much more helpful to do that. Back in the 80s, 80, wow, I guess it was 88, 
because it was the year Jamie was born. We had a kid that lived with us while he was going to, to school, Cal State Northridge. And uh, one of the classes he had to take was a physical education class. So he took weightlifting class. Okay? And so, you know, he goes out and gets weights and everything. And, you know, he wants somebody to, to go out and, and, uh, and lift weights with him. Because lifting weights by yourself is just flat out boring. So he asked me to do it. And so I went out. And you know what? Because the two of us were doing it together, we stuck with it. Right? I mean, both of us in a lot of weight. And for you know what, Shirley's out there lifting, lifting weights with us. She became a machette, studette, dudette. That's what we called her, right? She was out there lifting weights. We'd just take turns and we'd laugh and we'd have a good time and we were physically growing. Something that I would have never done without Dawn and Shirley. <clears throat> But when you're working together, two are better than one, Ecclesiastes says, for they have a better reward for their labor. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Right? When we work together and we encourage one another and we hold one another accountable, I mean, Don would get in there and say, dude, it's time to lift weights. Sometimes you don't want to get up out of the recliner and go lift weights. But when you got somebody saying, hey, let's go do this, then you do it. And when we encourage one another like that, spiritually, we can grow together as God wants us to do. We can choose to be dead or we can choose to be alive. He says, strengthen the things which remain. That means to make it fast, prop it up, you know, keep it from falling over. Things that are ready to die. Remember, remember how you received and heard. And when I read that, I think about when you first obeyed the gospel. When I first obeyed the gospel. What an exciting, it was new. It was like, man, I want to eat this up. I want to learn all there is about this. You know, I mean, I was sitting there and I went home and I, I, I read through every book and I did a little research and I just wrote down things about the books and everything. And I, I showed it to Barry and he says, how do you know all this stuff? I said, because I just started studying it. Right? Because I was excited about it. And you know what? Because I was excited about it, you know what I wanted to do? I wanted to tell everybody else about it. I wanted to share it with them. I said, hey, there's some stuff you need to know. Okay? What happened to that? It's like some older, supposedly wiser, mature Christian gets a hold of you and says, just relax, dude. You know, it's a long slog. You know, don't, don't just, you know, don't burn yourself out, right? Give me a break. Remember what you've heard. Remember what you've received. Hold fast to it. He says, repent. If, if we're sitting here and we're content to be dead, we need to repent. We need to turn away from that attitude. We need to turn away from that mindset. We need to look around and say, where can we improve? What can we do to make this congregation better, right? What can we do to make ourselves as a group better, better in God's eyes? I don't want Jesus looking at us and saying, you know what? You look kind of healthy, but you're dead. Is that what you want? I am sure that's not what Sardis wanted. But he says, if you will not, if you will not wake up, if you will not rise from the dead, I will come upon you as a thief, and you're not going to know when. It's going to happen, and you won't even know it happened. And then in verse 5, he who overcomes, he who overcomes what? He who overcomes being dead. You ever heard of burnout? You know, you got somebody, they're doing a job, they've been doing it for a long time, and reach this point where they just get burnt out. It's like, I might get to day one point where it says, you know what, I'm sick. So you're retired. Okay? We have a hobby that we're really into, and they're like, eh, burn out, I'm done with that. You can't burn out on being a Christian. You can't do it. You've got to hold on to it says you've got to overcome being dead. Jesus says your works are not perfect. 
He says there in uh, verse 2, the end of verse 2, I have not found your works perfect before God. And that word perfect means complete, as it does in most passages of the New Testament. He says, your works aren't complete. You're not done. You've still got stuff to do. You've still got stuff that needs to be completed. Right? You know age is? Right? You've got to work until the day. You can't be through a retirement plan, but you've got to work until you die. And this congregation, we need to be doing all we can to be what God wants us to be until we're ready to put a closed forever sign on the front door. We've got to overcome because our works are not complete yet. And those who do overcome, he says, they will be clothed in white. And again, there is that, that picture of victory. White is a symbol of victory. And then he says, I will not blot out his name from the book of life. We read about that book of life over in Revelation 20, verse 15, where it says, and anyone not found written in the book of life is cast in the lake of fire. Right? Do you know what that tells us? The people at Sardis, their name was in the book of life. Your book of life. You think it's a done deal? It can be blotted out. It can be it can be removed. Once saved, always saved. That's a lie straight from the devil. God expects us to be alive till the day we die. He expects us to fulfill our purpose to him to the day we die, as a congregation as well as individuals. And then he says, to he who overcomes, I will confess his name before my father. Now, I want you to think about this. Take a look at Matthew chapter 7, because we have a beautiful picture of it, a scary picture of it, in Matthew chapter 7. Beginning at verse 21, a passage that most of us are familiar with. Jesus says in verse 21 of Matthew chapter 7, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And then listen to this. Listen to verse 22. Many are going to say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? We were alive. We, we, were, we were, everybody thought we were alive. We thought we were alive. We did all these things in your name, and Jesus says, you're dead. Exactly the same thing he's saying to Sardis. Look at verse 23. He says, and then I will declare to them, I, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I, I don't know who you are. I, I never did. But we did all these things in your name. And Sardis thinks, well, we're alive. Brethren, you do not want to be standing before the judgment of God and have Jesus look at you and say, I don't know this person. I don't know who they are. Think about that for with everything that you know, with everything that you've experienced in your relationship with God, with everything that you've heard preached in a pulpit or taught in a Bible class or read for yourself from the Bible, think about what you have you are now and think about standing before God after you die and having Jesus look at you and saying, I don't know you. I can't even imagine. Can you imagine how horrifying that would be? I, I don't know you. Depart from me. You're not welcome. Leave. See, you know better than to let that happen. 
But if we're not honest in, in our own spiritual evaluation, if we don't hold one another accountable, is it possible that that could happen with us? Yeah, it's possible. All we got to do is trust him and do the best that we can. He'll take care of the rest. We don't have to worry about that. But you know what? I want to be better tomorrow in God's kingdom than I am today. And we as a congregation, we want to be better next week and the week after that and the week after that. The finish line, either the day of our death or the day when he comes. But until then, it's all about growing. And it's all about getting better. If you're here this morning and there's any way that we can help you do that, why don't you let us know as we stand sing for your encouragement. Let's go to prayer together. Our great and loving Father, we come before you to praise you, to give you all the glory and honor due you as the true and living God, the one who spoke all things into existence, the one who holds things together and one day will bring all things to an end and judge your people. We thank you for being a God of incredible love and mercy and grace, a God who showers us so abundantly physically in this life, but more importantly, Father, the incredible spiritual blessings that we have through the establishment of your church, the sharing of the gospel, and the holy scriptures that will be forever with us, that we can turn to those scriptures to learn of you and learn of your plan and your desire for us and what you have to teach us and share with us. We thank you for salvation that we have through your son, Jesus. We pray that we will live each day with an appreciation and a thankfulness for what you've done for us, and we will live lives of zeal for you, lives that show that we appreciate and love you for what you've done for us. Father, as we now turn to our Bible studies, we pray that we will open our hearts and minds, that we will be attentive to the things that we study, that we'll think about those things, that we'll share our thoughts with one another, and we will make applications of the things that we talk about today in our classes so that we can learn and grow and be more and more like your son Christ each day of our lives. We give thanks and pray to you, Father, in the name of Christ. Amen. Like Barry said, we're going to break uh, here in a bit and go to our Bible classes. Adult class here, adult class upstairs, children back in the hallway and upstairs. 
I think I can speak for Steve and Stuart, and the things that Craig said today are absolutely true. And we just want to encourage all of you to, to reach out, to step out, to be proactive and, and make this good church an even better church. Everybody do their part working together. So let's uh, break for our classes now. Our Father, we thank you for the day that you bless us with this day, a day on which we can come together and worship you, learn from you, and we pray that you would help us to, to see great things from your word, that you would open our eyes, our ears, and understand what you expect of us, and give us the strength and the courage to fulfill those, those things. We ask, Lord, that you would be with us throughout the study, 
so very thankful, Father, for your word and how you revealed yourself to us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. All right. Before we actually get into chapter one, chapter one is a little bit of a short chapter. How many verses is chapter one? It's only ten verses. Okay? And uh, we're going to look at chapter one. Hey, Mary. Good to see you. And um, before we do that, I want to talk to you a little bit about the religion or the doctrine of Gnosticism. Okay? And believe me, I'm not going to bore you with all the details. But if we get at least a look at what Gnostic teaching was, then it's going to really greatly help us to understand First John. Okay? Um, the word Gnosticism, that we put it up here. The basic tenets of Gnosticism. Okay? A Gnostic, it comes from the word knowledge. It comes from the Greek word for knowledge, to know. Okay? And this religion was developed, it grew out of the church, okay? individuals in the church, and it was all about the idea that the more you know, the better chance you got of being saved. And they base their salvation on knowledge. Now, the thing is, is we want to know about the word, right? And the more we do know about God and his word, I think probably the better the chances are that we're going to be saved. But the Gnostics looked at it as being some kind of a, a secret, hidden wisdom that was only revealed to a few. Okay? Not everybody had access to it. And only the enlightened, you know, the knowledgeable ones, were actually going to attain to salvation. Now, I cannot tell you, and I don't think it's necessary for us to know, where these different beliefs came from that they had. But if we know that they had them and we know what they are, again, it will help us understand writings uh, such as 1 John. So the Gnostics believed that God did not create the heavens and the earth. They were created by a lesser, impure emanation from God called a demiurge who is mistaken with the real God by those without gnosis or knowledge, okay? Gnosticism believed that spirit is good, all matter, all material things are evil. They're tainted, they're corrupt, they're evil. Therefore, a good God could not create the heavens and the earth because that's all evil. So what he did is he created a lesser version of himself, who then created a lesser version of itself, who then created a lesser version of itself. These are called eons, okay? A-O-N-S, right? And these emanations from God finally got, I mean, there's just, just multiple, numerous multitudes of emanations, until finally, one was so distant from God that it could deal with matter. And the Gnostics called it the demi-urge, demi right? Like a demi-god type thing. But I guess they had the urge to create material things. I don't know. And so it, through its minions, created the heavens and the earth that we live in. Who came up with that? What they base that on? Who knows? All matter is evil, only the spirit is good. Thus, Jesus did not come in flesh, only in the spirit. Okay. Jesus did not come in flesh. I want you to take a look at the first four verses of John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1. He says, That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, which our hands have handled. Concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. 
All right, let me stop right there. So here's the synopsis. Jesus did not come in the flesh, only in the spirit. What's John doing in the first three verses? Refuting not to. Yeah, he's denying that. He's saying, we've touched him, we've seen him, we've heard him. He was in the flesh. He actually came in the flesh. Okay. The Gnostics believe, no, he couldn't be the Son of God if he came in the flesh. The Gnostics also believe the Spirit of God came upon the man, Jesus, and departed from him before he died on the cross. Because you can't kill the Spirit of God, right? Okay. And so, Jesus was just a man, like any other man, and the Spirit of God actually came upon him. And the Messiah Spirit, if you will. And it left before he died on the cross. Jesus himself was not the Son of God. Okay? Um, it was the Spirit that came from God. Salvation has nothing to do with Jesus' death on the cross, but only on what the Spirit upon him taught. The cross has nothing to do with salvation. The only thing it has to do with salvation is what the Spirit that came upon the man Jesus taught while he was here. And so when we learn all of that, we learn that secret knowledge, they, they refer to as secret knowledge, that's where salvation is going to take place. Cross has nothing to do with it. The Spirit left before Jesus died on the cross. The true knowledge of God taught by the Spirit is only accessible to some people, not all people. Okay? This is what the Gnostics taught. So, with that idea and that philosophy, what's that going to do to a congregation? Now you're encouraging. Well, it's not encouraging. Making arrogance. It's what? It's going to tear it apart. It's going to tear it apart, right? Because this this knowledge is only accessible to some people, the ones that have the secret knowledge, right? And you know what's going to happen with that attitude. They're going to become proud, arrogant, strutting around like peacocks. What's that going to do with love? I, I it's going to throw it out the window. They're not going to love these lesser people that can't delve into this knowledge or learn these things from the Spirit. Yeah. So why do you think John spends so much time talking about love and talking about how we're supposed to love one another? And he says, those who don't love one another, they don't have God. They'll tell you, oh, I've got God because I've got secret knowledge. They haven't got God, right? Since all matter is evil, Gnostics adopted two approaches to the material world. This chair is evil because it's matter, it's tangible, it exists, it's not spirit, right? That, how, how could that chair possibly be evil? Well, what if you wanted that chair and I wanted that chair? See what that chair did to us? What is the chair? <laughs> Here's your approach. That was all came up together and they shouldn't have. Asceticism. Okay? Avoid interaction with the material world as much as possible. Okay? And so the idea is asceticism says, and the Gnostics said, okay, if all matter is evil, we're going to avoid interaction with it as much as possible. We're not going to touch it, we're not having to do with it. And since they believed the material world was evil, the material things in the world became irrelevant. What one does in life is of no consequence. Because matter itself doesn't matter, it's, it's just evil. And sin is of no importance. What we do or how we conduct ourselves has no bearing on salvation. It's all about knowledge. Right? And those were the two ideas. Well, all matter is evil. Then my body is evil, my physical being is evil, the chair is evil, the building is evil, everything's evil. It doesn't really matter what I do to do it. It doesn't matter what I do with my body, it's of no consequence. Sin is of no importance. Take a look at verse 5 of the first chapter. This is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you. 
that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The cross is of no consequence. What cleanses us from all sin? The blood of Christ. His death on the cross. Okay? If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Sin doesn't matter. It's of no consequence because all matter is evil. So I can take two views of it. I can say, okay, I'm going to avoid matter, or I say it doesn't matter, so I'm just going to jump into it. Okay? I can do anything I want with my body. I can do anything I want with the physical world. And so it's not sin. So if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make a liar and his word is not in us. See, you have people in the church that are getting wrapped up in religious doctrine and philosophy, and they're saying sin doesn't matter. It's not sin because all matters to you. So John's saying, if we say that we have no sin, we're fooling ourselves. Right? If, if we say that we have no sin, the truth is not in us. That's why he's dealing with that. Because the Gnostics just completely threw it out the window. I need no salvation through the cross because it's not possible. I need no salvation for matter because it's all inherently evil anyway. Salvation is only dependent on our secret knowledge of God. It's just what I know, right? What I've learned. Those are the tests of Gnosticism. When you understand that, John becomes much more understandable. This is what he's dealing with. This is what he's writing in regards to. And this is why he's saying the things that he says. So, let's read those first four verses again. John says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. All right. So the first question here in your lesson sheet, what is John trying to establish in the first four verses? Christ came in the flesh. Okay. They were witnesses. Okay. The physical reality of Jesus is the incarnate Son of God. He's just laying that right on the line. He was real. He came in the flesh, which the Gnostics think is impossible because flesh is evil. It says that his life was manifested. There at the beginning of verse 2, the life was manifested. And then um, right before verse 3, it was manifested to us. What does the word manifested mean? Made known, maybe? Made known? Yeah, made known. Okay? Revealed, made clear, made known, demonstrated, caused to be seen. So his life was made known, made clear. God caused us to be able to see it. God caused us to be able to see that his son actually came and lived among us. Okay? Um, what does John, the Gospel, chapter 1, verse 14 say? John 1, 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. <laughs> yeah. The Word became flesh and it lived, Jesus lived among us. 
Turn over to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 15. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, the writer of Hebrews said, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. If Jesus didn't come in the flesh, could he be tempted like we are? Turn to Hebrews 2, 17, and 19. It makes it even more clear. 2, 17, and 18. Mm -hmm. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest and think of things of God to make propitiation for the same people. For that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those were tempted. So if he didn't come in the flesh, was he able to be tempted like we are? That means we may like the brethren, that's pretty simple. Yeah. So be like us. He's tempted like us. He's just like us. Right? Interesting phrase in verse 14 of chapter 4. Our high priest who passed through the heavens. What is what does that mean? He passed through the heavens. Came from heaven to earth. Possibly. Yeah, I mean we don't we don't think about that. Yeah. He he physically passed through the heavens, came down to be with us. Right? I mean, he was manifested within the womb of Mary, and then he was born into this world just like we all are. But I don't think a lot of times we think about the fact he had to leave his father's throne. And he had to come down to this earth. Yeah, he passed through the heavens to come and be with us. Right? Uh, I just thought that was kind of interesting as I was reading. Right? Also, um, take a look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, uh, note the similarity between the first verses of 1 John and John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. 1 John says, that which was from the beginning. Okay, going back to the very beginning. But notice what he says about Christ. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. And he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, was life, was light of men, and light shined in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Those Gnostics did not comprehend it, right? I mean, he made everything. He upholds all things by the word of power. So for the Gnostics to sit there and say, Jesus, the Spirit that came upon the man, Jesus, had nothing to do with the material. It says right here that he made everything. Everything was made through him. Um, and so John is, is dealing with those issues and dealing with those things. Okay. Um, in question two, according to verse three, why is John trying to establish these things? Verse 3 says, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you so that what? We have fellowship. Yeah, you have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with God and the Son. It, it reminds me, me of a lawyer that, that has presented me the case. Yeah, I want you to be aware of these things. So you're aware of it, you can have fellowship with us. Now, here's what's interesting. 
If you don't have this doctrine, if you don't believe this doctrine, can you have fellowship with the apostles? Can you have fellowship with God? If you don't believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, if you don't believe he died on the cross for your sins, you can't have fellowship with God, right? You have heard me say that our fellowship here is not based on perfect agreement because that's really kind of impossible between any two human beings. But it's based on what we agree to do collectively when we come here. And our fellowship is based on that. But in order for us to have fellowship, are there some things that we must agree on? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. We have to agree that Jesus is the Son of God. We have to agree that he died on the cross for our sins. We have to agree that he came to the flesh. We have to agree that we're sinners. We have to agree that if we walk in the light, the blood of his Son cleanses us from all sin. Right? There are certain things that we must agree on to have fellowship. But perfect agreement is not necessary for fellowship. I mean, you agree that it's okay, and I, I don't want to open up a can of worms, so I'll just let it go. You think that it's okay for us to use a piano on the worship, okay? I don't think it's okay to use a piano on the worship. Can we still worship together? Yes. Yeah, how? <clears throat> By the person who thinks it's okay not forcing his opinion on you, not forcing his belief on you. He says, I know that will violate your conscience. I know that that will put you in a position where you feel like you're sinning, so I'm not going to do that. Paul establishes rules when it comes to eating things sacrificed to idols. Right? He talked about their matters of conscience. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. Right? Our agreement is as to what we do when we come together. Right? There are some people who think it's perfectly okay for a Christian to have a glass of wine at dinner. There are others who think, no, a Christian shouldn't eat, eat, I mean, drink any alcohol at all. Can we still have fellowship? Yeah. That, that doesn't mess with what we're doing here. Okay. Do we try to teach each other about that? Sure we can. Right. We've got to be convinced in our own mind. And there are a number of things like that that enter into the realm of opinion a lot of times. So we just need to be careful about what we press upon one another. Right? But then Paul say in Ephesians someplace that until we reach the unity, we were, he gave us possible prophets and right until we reach we're working towards that unity right but you never got to go how to say never well we have unity in the things of the gospel exactly right but then there are other things out there like you got some Christian that thinks it's okay to go you know join the army and fight in Ukraine right you've got others who say no I'm not Jesus subjective can they still have fellowship certainly they can Right, maybe not on front lines, but they can have fellowship with congregation without any problem. Okay. Um, and so we need to keep that in mind. So, according to verse 3, John is trying to establish these truths so that his readers will be able to have fellowship with the apostles and their fellowship with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. Okay. <coughs> Things that the Gnostics are teaching are jeopardizing this fellowship. Because, I mean, they've got a doctrine simply based on, oh, I know more than you, I'm saved. You, you can't even understand this stuff, so you're lost, right? The material doesn't matter. I really don't have to have any kind of real relationship with you. I don't need to love you. Um, and they don't understand, well, that means you can't love God. Right? So, John is writing for the sake of fellowship. He's writing for the sake of unity. He's writing to overcome these false teachings. Um, and we've already talked about question three here a little bit. What is fellowship? Spend some time trying to define it. I mean, if you were to define fellowship, what is it? Faith. 
you know, we're Brain talking about we're supposed to have fellowship with one another. How, how does that take place? Friendship, caring. What? Friendship and caring. Friendship and caring. Okay, some people would call that fellowship. Time together. Time together. Right. Association is certainly involved in fellowship. Okay. Um, communion. You know, when we take Lord's Supper, we call that communion a lot of times. That's where we're kind of joining with Christ and his death, we're remembering him, joining with God. His partnership, his fellowship, sharing, uh, having things in common, participation, joint participation. Um, it's based on agreement, right? We all agree on what we're going to do, what we're not going to do when we come here on the first day of the week. Therefore, we can have fellowship with one another. Um, our fellowship in the congregation is based on our agreement about what we do, not necessarily on what we all believe in every particular. Um, and so John's going to address the idea of doctrinal agreement and agreement in regard to the conduct of the Christians here a little bit. What does Amos 3.3 3 say? I shall look up Amos chapter 3 at verse 3. So you got it? Why don't you read it for us? Do two walk together unless they have agreed? Yeah. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? All right. What's that talking about? They can't. They can't walk together unless they're agreed on a destination. All right. Unless they're agreed on where they're going. You know, sure now I get up one morning, she says, I'm going to the Sam's, and I say, well, I'm going to Walmart. Are we going together? No, I've got to agree, okay, we'll go to Sam's, then we'll go, and then she's got to agree that we're going to go to Walmart. And that's the only way we can walk together, okay? Now, notice what John says here in verse 5 of uh, 1 John chapter 1. He says, this is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. All right, so what does that mean if we're walking in darkness? We're not with God. We can't have fellowship with God. We can't walk together. Okay? So if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And then verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And then because of that, the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son, cleanses us from all sin. I want to be in agreement with God. I want to have fellowship with God. If God's in the light, I want to walk in the light. I can't, you know, wander around in the darkness because I can't have fellowship. Um, so what does it mean to walk in darkness or the light? What does that mean if we walk in the darkness? We say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness. The way of life. It's a way, way of life. The way you live your life. Okay. Walking in darkness is living a life that is not in agreement or fellowship with God. Yeah, because he's a light. And so to walk in darkness means that we're living our life a certain way. Kyle. Yeah, let's just go back to verse 5. That God is the light, and in him is no darkness. So he's laying it out that darkness is the opposite of what God is. And so if you're the secret knowledge, special knowledge, all those things. So if you're not in fellowship with God, you have to be walking in the dark. And you cannot be walking in the light. If you want fellowship with God, you have to be in the light. So it's, it's kind of going back and forth of either you're this or you're this. There's no okay. in-between. There's no floating back and forth. Okay. Very good point. There's no gray area. Right. It's either light or it's dark. The Bible is very consistent in pointing out spiritual dichotomy. That means one or the other. Right? You're in fellowship with God or you're not. You're in the light or you're in the dark. You're on the narrow path or you're on the broad path. Right? And one of the things that all of us have to evaluate from time to time is where am I walking or where am I standing? Am I in the light or am I in the dark? And we've got to be honest with ourselves when we make that evaluation. Right? Like, I'm in the dark. 
Where is that going to get me? I'm on the white path. Where am I going to end up? I'm not in fellowship with God. Therefore, the blood of the Son is not going to cleanse me from all sin. Yeah. Well, it's, it's said several times. It's the practice of sin or the practice of righteousness. That's right. It's, it's what we do. That's right. And that's what we're going to talk about here in, in a little bit. Okay. Um, walking in darkness is not living according to truth. Either intentionally or in ignorance. You got people walking around in the darkness because they're ignorant. Yes. Okay. You've got a lot of people in the religious world walking around in darkness because they're ignorant of God's actual will. Then you've got people walking around in darkness intentionally. Don't want to have anything to do with God, don't care, don't want to know anything about God. So I'm perfectly comfortable here in the dark. And then the Bible talks about people love darkness rather than light because their works were made exposed or manifest. Walking in the light is living according to God's revealed truth. Walking in the light is living in agreement or fellowship with God. Walking in the light grants his cleansing of sin by the blood of Jesus. So question five asks, how does walking either the darkness or the light relate to sin? If you're walking in darkness, are you sinning? Clearly. If you're walking in the light, does it mean that you're not going to sin? No. No. See, and that's what some people get hung up on. And that's what you were talking about, Kim, when you were talking about practice. Walking in darkness is certainly synonymous with sin. Walking in the light does not mean living a sinless life. Take a look at verse 8. In verse 8, he says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Okay? Who is he talking to? Christians. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to people who are walking in the light. And he said, but if you're walking in the light and you say you have no sin, the truth is not in you. Then you look at verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So, yeah. You know, you've heard me say it many times. We're all sinners. We're all a mess. That's why we're here. There's not a single one of us that's better than anybody else. All of us, apart from God, are just as doomed. And we talked about this last week a little bit, or on Wednesday night. Our tendency to quantify sin, right? We sit here and we think, oh, well, you know, I'm not as bad as that guy over there. I mean, that guy did this and this, he did that, he did that, right? All I did was told a few lies. Like, who's condemned? Both of us. If you break the law, you're a law. Yeah, yeah, you break the law. That's the law. It. it. It doesn't matter where you break it at. That's right. Okay. And we were talking about this in relationship with David. You know, his sin with Bathsheba, the adultery, the murder, the conspiracy, the covetousness, all that Yet God forgives him. Right? I'm glad. I'm certainly glad God forgave him because that means there's hope for me. Yeah. Right? You know, it's like somebody who lied. You know, the publican that went up to the, the temple and said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I have no idea what a sin was. But Jesus says he went down to his house and justified him. Right? I mean, do any of us want to stand before God with the sin of us telling a lie, not forgive? Never murdered anybody, never robbed a store or a bank. Never kidnapped anybody. Right? A lie? Yeah, I've told far too many lies in my life. Do I want to stand before God without that being forgiven? Not a chance. Well, as long as He forgives me for the murder I committed, right? I'm doomed. And, you know, we have to understand that. So when we talk about walking in either the darkness or the light, we're not talking about sinning or not sinning necessarily. Um, take a look at 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 through 8. In 1 
First John chapter 3 and verse 7, John says, Little children, let no one see you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, but the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So he's talking about practicing righteousness. Right? That's what we do. That's why we're here. We're trying to be righteous. A baseball player practices his skill set all the time. Does that mean he never makes an error? No. No. He's got to make errors. Right? You don't believe it? Just go to YouTube and look up baseball errors. You know, look up baseball players who just wish they were invisible. Okay? Was it Buffer who blew the World Series? Nope. <laughs> right? The ball went right under his glove. I mean, and he's one of the great players in baseball. Right? But um, everyone remembers that. So what? Everyone <laughs> remembers that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, the idea is that you're practicing righteousness. I'm still going to make mistakes. It says, but he who sins is of the devil. And that word sins there, if I'm not mistaken, is a form of the Greek word which means practices sin. Right? He sins. It's a lifestyle. It's a continuous thing. And that's, that's what we don't do. Now, look at verse 10, same chapter. And this is shorn of God and shorn of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. And in chapter 2 and verse 29, uh, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. So that's what identifies children of God. They're practicing righteousness. Okay? It's a way of life for them. Now here's my question. Okay, we're not supposed to practice sin. Is it uncommon for an individual to struggle with one temptation maybe throughout their life? Is that uncommon? No. no. You can have Christians that they just, I cannot overcome X or Y or Z or whatever it is. That's what trips them up every time. That's where they fall. That's where they, they sin. Okay. At what point does that become practicing sin? When he doesn't ask for help. When what? When he doesn't ask for help. And from who? From the, the fellowship. From God? Maybe the people he have fellowship with. Okay. Um, I had a guy come to me once, and anybody who knows this guy, and anybody who looks at this guy, me, this guy is he's got it going on, right? He had a difficult marriage. He was married to a man, impressive woman. And boy, and to this day, she just all over the map. So he had the habit of going to see prostitutes. I mean, he knew it was wrong. Get his conscience to kill him, but that's where he went to relieve stress. That's where he went to find some kind of consolation, um, and that was his pressure relief, right? At what point is he not going to be forgiven of that? At, at what point is he really trying to resist that temptation? You know, at what point, you know, is he just giving into it? I have a question though. If you presented that without saying his wife was a medic impressive, right. that, would that change the way that you saw the thought? Oh no, no, not at all. Not at all. I mean, it, it, it makes no difference at all. I was just explaining in his mind right. this is why he's doing it. So he might be justifying it. Okay. Because he's got a lot of marriage. Right. right. But I think that that's wrong to say because he has a wife who is medic depressed. So right. That it shouldn't have been, I mean, that's not a, an excuse. But in his mind, it is. In his mind, that's justification. 
right? So let's say you've got an individual and his wife's frigid, okay? And she is not um, giving him physically the things that he needs as a man. So in his mind, he justifies going to a prostitute, right? He's going to rationalize. It doesn't make it right. You know, there's no way it makes it's it right. because the husband goes to the prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> now, it starts somewhere, right? We have a tendency to, that, that one thing that we struggle with, do we not all of us have a tendency to justify it some, sometimes, especially when we're about to commit it? And we know we're going to commit it. Right? And we sit there, we know we shouldn't. And you know what? We, we may go for a couple of weeks. We may go for a couple months. We may go for a year where, okay, we've got a handle on it. And all of a sudden, bam, it pops up. Some circumstance pops up. Some stressful situation pops up. Doesn't matter what it is. And then we cave. Right? At what point does that become? Walking in darkness. But at what point does that become practice and sin? <laughs> but, well, I, I'm continuing to do it because that's the temptation that I'm struggling with throughout my entire life. I think it's whenever you quit asking forgiveness. For one, that would be one thing. Yeah. I mean, if you're not, if you're not. Yeah. He tried to turn it around. Are you, are you, are you fighting against the temptation? Yeah. Are you, are you struggling against the temptation? Are you asking God for help? Are you approaching other people where, I, where the start of it, my individual uh, friend came to me and he confessed. And he said, I need help. He said, I need help. Um, ultimately, he's, you're not trying to please God. Because what? He said, ultimately, you're not trying to please God because if you know that this is wrong, this is something that he doesn't want you to do. You're trying to please him to stop you're seeking help. Yeah. If you, he's saying that you're not seeking help. Right. Yeah. You're, you're looking to God for help. You're trying to overcome it. Uh, but you know what? Stuff like this plays, plays with people's psyche. You know, my buddy comes to me and he says, look, this is this. It's just a, a circular thing. It just keeps happening. It keeps going on. He says, I need somebody to help hold me accountable. He says, so what I want you to do is every once in a while, not a regular schedule, but just look at me and ask me, are you behaving, right? Are you doing what you're supposed to do or not doing what you're not supposed to do? Because one thing he wouldn't do is lie. He had no problem with being honest. He had no problem with telling the truth. You know, so if you ask him point blank, did you go see a prostitute last week? They'll tell you yes, or they'll tell you no. Right? And he didn't like to admit yes. So if he knew I was going to ask him, that was helping him you know, stay focused. I worked for a year with their kleptomaniac. Did <laughs> you lock your desk? Pardon? Did you lock your desk? <laughs> no, no, but, but it, I mean, he was struggling, struggling, struggling. I mean, we went back, we took things back, he paid for them, he apologized, and, and, and he struggled with that daily. And, and uh, so, yes, yeah, so there are things in people's life that you struggle with. For sure. Yeah. When do the, I think it, when you stop fighting, and I worked with another guy that was a preacher, yeah. that quit, he says, I know it's wrong. I don't care. <laughs> oh, he quit preaching? No, he quit. Preaching? He, he went for the moment. Oh, okay. And, uh, but he says, I know it's wrong. I don't care. Right. So that, he, he, I mean, he gave up. Yeah. He was no longer. Yeah. And see, to me, that's the problem when we talk about overcoming a temptation, try to overcome temptation. When you commit the sin, the actual commission of the sin itself becomes a temptation. Why? Because what? When you commit a sin that you're struggling against, you know, a temptation, you find yourself, this one always trips me up, 
You commit that sin, right? How does that sin itself become a temptation? What's the temptation? To quit. The temptation is to give up. The temptation is to believe the lie that God would never forgive you. The temptation is to think, I'm doomed, there's no hope, I'm hopeless. And God allows us to be tempted. Never but that which we're able, boy, then that compound guilt, right? But it's a challenge that a lot of people face. There's so many people that I've talked to that come to me with that one sin. And I preached on that one sin. If I could just get a handle on this one sin, right? So what's going to happen to you once you get a handle on that one sin? Yeah, yeah another one's going to pop up, right? Not going to get off the hook that easy. It comes down to, in regard to our sin, it comes down to trust that God's going to forgive us. You know, you can't sin presumptuously. You can't just say, ah, you know, I don't care, God's going to take care of that. Uh, that's presumptuous sin. Right? Um, you've got to continue in the fight, as Ken talked about. All right, so question six is who is, who is being addressed in these verses? Well, John, of course, is talking to Christians. We cannot practice sin, but we're not sinless. We commit sin. Um, you know, what we have is forgiveness. Question seven. So what truth does this passage reveal about ourselves? We've talked about this earlier. We're all sinners. There's not a one of us who's perfect. And we're all going to do things that are wrong. And we're all going to make mistakes. So with that in light, question eight, in light of this truth, how should we respond when one of us stumbles? With gentleness. Gentleness. Love. Understanding. Love. How we would want to be treated. How we would want to be treated. Compassion. All right. Take a look over in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual. That word overtaken, like, very much means pounced on from behind. You got the idea that temptation is stalking him. And it, it, it's a tactic. So if he's overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. You know, if you start taking, or I start taking a high-minded attitude towards the sinner who needs help, I'm now engaging in sin, right? Because we're all in the same boat, right? Um, over in James chapter 2, verse 13, it says that we have mercy. For he who is without mercy will be judged without mercy. And mercy triumphs over judgment. Okay. Yeah. I think the key there is the person is overtaken. He's not just, we, we can't just condone continuous sinning. Right. You know, but someone who's overtaken, someone who's fighting, we have to help. Right. That's right. You got to come to their rescue. Uh, question nine, last question, who is John talking about having fellowship with in verse seven? In verse seven, who is he talking about having fellowship with? It says there, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. <coughs> Let's have fellowship with him. Yeah, fellowship with God. All right. So it's very easy to read that and talk about having fellowship with one another here. And that may be part of it, but ultimately, if we walk in the light as God is in the light, we have fellowship with Him. And that's when the blood of His Son cleanses us from all sin. All right. All right. Anybody got any questions or comments about chapter 1 here? At all? All right. Then we'll get to chapter 2 next week.
Looks like we're about time to begin. If you're using a songbook, we're going to sing number 53, Awesome God. 53. Our God is an awesome God, he reigns from heaven above in midst of power and love. Our God is an awesome God, our God is an awesome God, he reigns from heaven above in midst of power and love. Our God is an awesome God. Pray with me, please. Father, we thank you so much for this assembly time that we have to be together as a family before you. We pray, Father, that you would be with us in our attempts to worship you this morning. Help us to focus our minds on the praise that's due you and on our profession of faith in glorifying you as our Lord and our King. And we pray, Father, that you would be with our family here in all the ways that we have deficiencies and that you would open our eyes to the things that we need and the assistance that we can give one to another. Help us, Lord, to truly strive to wear your name boldly in this community and to live a life that would be characterized as walking in the light. Help us, Father, when we fall short of that. Help us to do what you would have us to do and say the things that you would have us to say that your name would be glorified and your mission would be accomplished here on this earth. And we pray, Father, that you take us home to live with you after our death. In Jesus' name, amen. Number 180, you are my all in all. Jesus land of God
As we turn our attention to the Lord's Supper, we're going to sing number 197 to help prepare our minds for that. We saw thee not, 197. We saw thee not when thou didst come to this Christ surpasses all knowledge. You know, there's a lot in that statement. Don't worry, I'm not going to exhaust the subject. I could literally just sit down after saying that, and that would say enough. Jesus, the love of Jesus surpasses all knowledge. I just want to make a couple points for us to think about while we partake of the Lord's Supper. You know, love can be shown and is shown in many ways. But Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, 
than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. 1 John 3.16 says, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our life for our brethren. But Christ did not show his love by dying only. He showed his love by living. He came down from heaven to become flesh. Hebrews 2 tells us he was made like his brethren so he could be a merciful high priest and make propitiation with God for the sins of the people. Because he suffered and was tempted is why he was able to do this and is able to aid us when we're tempted. It's because he became and lived in the flesh that he's able to do this for us. That's true love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I don't even have to tell you where that one came from. I think we all know. But one thing we don't really think about a lot is what that verse tells us. Notice the contrast in what God did for us. From perishing to living forever. From a non-existence, basically, or, or an existence that's not very appealing to an existence of living with God forever. Just stop and think about that for a second. Let's embrace God's love and let's pass it on to others around us, no matter who they are. And let's show our love right now by communing with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <coughs> Dear God, thank you for this chance to be here to worship you and to remember what Jesus did for us. Please be with us as we partake of this. Please help us to remember what this bread represents, that Jesus died, that his body was broken so that we could have a chance to live with you forever someday. Please help us all to partake of this in a way that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you once again thanking you so much for the love that you have shown us by giving up your son's life upon the cross for our sins, to take upon our sins, upon his shoulders, and take him to the cross with him. Father, thank you so much for that love. Thank you so much for that opportunity that it gives us to be able to be with you one day in heaven. But Father, help us to take our minds back to that day in which he went upon the cross and all the pain and all the suffering that he did because he loved us so much and because you want us to be with you. And Father, help us to remember that this cup that represents the blood that was shed upon that cross and that he did that for us. And Father, we thank you so much for that. Help us to partake of this cup in a manner that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Once again, it's good to be here with you this morning. Our lesson this morning is going to come from Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> been thinking a lot about the church here at Old Wire Road uh, recently. Last week, talked about a lesson from Ephesians that told us that God gave us, basically, He gave us the church so that we could all grow to the measure and the stature of Christ. And, you know, I'm just, I'm thinking about what it is that we're all about and what it is that we're here for. And as I'm thinking about that and putting together this lesson, I kept coming back to Hebrews chapter 10. And it, it seemed to, to fit the situation I've been thinking about. The Hebrew Christians, what occasioned this letter, is the Hebrew Christians were getting discouraged. They were getting discouraged. They were getting beat down by family, friends, and the communities in which they lived. They are being slowly worn down. Uh, this letter uh, supposedly had been written some 30 years after Christ ascended to heaven. And a lot of them are giving up. They're just giving up in their Christianity. And um, we have, and many congregations in the, in the country and in the world, have suffered some difficult hard times and some setbacks. And 
we need to bounce back from that. Um, you don't have to look around very long, very hard to see that our numbers are down. Uh, we have people that started watching the services on YouTube at home. And I'm just going to be very direct with you, and I'm going to look right in the camera when I say this. It's time for you to come back. It's time for you to start assembling again with your brethren because we need you to help us, and you need help as well. So I appreciate the technology. I appreciate what it allowed us to do during COVID, but let's not now use that technology as an excuse to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Um, that's something that we need to pay attention to. Um, I know a number of, of members of the church, not just from this congregation, but from other congregations who have become so accustomed to be able to just sit at home in the comfort of their pajamas and feel like they're participating in the worship of God. And they're not. When we forsake the assembling of ourselves together, we are not fulfilling one of the primary purposes God gave us for having congregations and for assembly. And that's so we can be together and be with one another and speak and greet one another face to face. And that's what I want to talk about with you a little bit this morning. Um, we need to bounce back. We need to bounce back from whatever the devil throws at us, whatever society throws at us, whatever circumstances we might find ourselves living in. Um, I can't remember who it was I was talking about uh, or talking about talking to the other day. Oh, it was Carrie, Carrie Griggs. Um, I don't pay a whole lot of attention to the news anymore. But if you do, it seems like there's a bunch of rotten stuff going on in the world, doesn't there? Right. And um, I remember talking to some friends recently as well. And they're, they're all in a dither and they're all stressed out about, you know, this is happening and this is happening and that's happening and all this kind of stuff. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, you woke up this morning, right? Well, that's the first good thing that's happened to you today. And uh, it's probably in your bed in your house, right? And then you got up and ate some food at your table. And uh, you went to work, and then you came home from that job, and you sat down in front of your big old flat screen TV and got all stressed out over the state of the world. It's like, where's your trust? We have a lot to be thankful for. God has blessed us with tremendous gifts. He's, he's tremendous, blessed us with tremendous blessings. And the greatest of those blessings outside of his son actually dying on the cross is this right here. It's brethren, it's brothers and sisters in Christ who share our faith, who have dedicated themselves to serving God and who are willing to assemble with us and help us get to heaven. Um, you've heard me say this before. There is no more important group of people in your life than the people right here in your local congregation. You know, I know that you've got family that you love tremendously. Um, I do too. But they don't help me get to heaven. You help me get to heaven. You're, you're the greatest blessing I have in my life outside of Christ dying on the cross. Um, and we need to start thinking about one another in those terms. And we need to start recognizing that. We need to stop taking the opportunity that God has provided for us to assemble. We need to stop taking that for granted. And we need to treasure it. And we need to treasure the time that we have to be together. When I first went to just a single service on Sunday morning, I was ecstatic because we had people that started attending all the services. Right? People that wouldn't come on Sunday nights or wouldn't come to Bible class, all of a sudden we found them coming to the first service, the Bible class, the second service. And you remember how enthusiastic we all were about that? You remember how uplifting that was? You remember the worship services that we were having, the singing and the, and the praying and, and, and the lessons that we were studying? That, that was, we've lost that. It, it disappeared. It disappeared with COVID. It disappeared with the economy. It disappeared with everybody being paranoid and wearing face masks and stuff like that. And I'm not saying that there was anything wrong with wearing face masks. 
But I think that we have allowed this to just kind of beat us down like those first century Hebrews got beat down and discouraged and they quit fulfilling their responsibilities. It's time to get over that. It's time to get back to what we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to be doing. And that's what I want to share with you this morning. In the face of all that discouragement that the Hebrew Christians were suffering, we're in verse 19 of chapter 10. You've heard this passage many, many times before. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. Okay, there's our circumstance right there. Our circumstance is not the economy. Our circumstance is not interest rates. It's not the housing market. It's not the perceived collapse of the economy. It is that right there. Christ died on the cross, and he has made the way to God clear through that sacrifice. That is our circumstance. That's where we live. That is what we need to pay attention to. So being aware of that incredibly important and valuable circumstance, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another in so much the more as you see the day approaching. In chapter 2 of Hebrews at verse 1, he talks about drifting away. He says, we've got to be careful not to drift away. Here in this exhortation, he says, let us draw near. And I'm afraid what has happened with us, myself included, is that we have allowed ourselves to drift away from the most important circumstance of our life. And that's our salvation. That's our access to God, which Jesus has consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, through his sacrifice. And it's just like, okay, here we are, same week in, week out. We need to reignite, if you will. That's a, a phrase that Brent Kirchhoff used in a series of lessons. We need to light the fire. Where's that song that, that we always sing, right? We need to sing that song. We need to sing light the fire because that's what we need to do within each of our hearts and each of our souls. We need to draw near. And it says to draw near with a true heart. That is one that is genuine, it's sincere, it's real, it's appreciative of God's grace and what he's done for us. You can walk into the presence of God Almighty because of what Christ has done for you. You can come to him at prayer any time, day or night, and you can lay all of your concerns and all of your troubles and all of your tears before his throne. He won't kick you out. He will answer every single prayer that you lay at his feet. There is no one greater than that who cares for you. You can do that in full assurance of faith, and that's trusting what Jesus has done for you. He says, having your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience, that's what Jesus did for you. Take a look at Hebrews 9 verses 11 through 14. Right across the page from where we're at in Hebrews chapter 9, beginning at verse 11, but Christ came as high priest to the good things to come, and with a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, 
who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the internal inheritance. He, just, he did not just die for everyone contemporary with him or everyone to come after him. He died for everyone that came before him. We need to draw near to that. He says, having your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience, that's what Christ did for us. We can enter into the presence of God boldly, without fear. That, that sounds like an impossibility, doesn't it? But that's what Christ has secured for us. That's why there's a warning in verse 29 of Hebrews chapter 10. How much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? When I disregard the blood that Christ shed that he sprinkled on my heart to cleanse it from an evil conscience, I'm just setting myself up for punishment. A worse punishment than can actually be imagined. We can approach him, we can draw near because we've had our bodies washed with pure water. And clearly that's a reference to baptism. In obeying the gospel and accessing the blood of Christ that was shed for us on the cross, we now have boldness to approach God. So then he says, and having that, let us hold fast. He says in verse 29, let us hold, or verse 23, excuse me, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Go to chapter 3 at verse 6 to read a little bit about the confession of our hope. Talking about the faithfulness of Christ to his Father and in his house. He says in verse 6, But Christ is the Son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. And I know you've heard this before. You'll hear it many times before you pass from this life. Our hope is our confident expectation of going to heaven. Hold fast to that. Don't let that go. Hold on to it with all that you've got and do so without wavering because he who promised is faithful. God keeps his promises. Take a look at Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 20. In Hebrews chapter 6, beginning at verse 13, the writer says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. You know, you take an oath in a court of law, you put your hand on the Bible, and what do you say? So help me God, right? That's because God's greater than we are. Now we take an oath in his name, but you know what? God has no one greater to swear by, so he swore by himself. In verse 14 it says, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. This was his promise to Abraham. I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to multiply you. And you know what? Abraham wasn't any better than you. He wasn't any better than me. He wasn't a perfect man. He was a flawed hero of faith. But he didn't let that sin, he didn't let his imperfections separate him from God. He continued in his faith to God. God made him a promise, and Abraham knew he was going to keep it. In verse 15, so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater... And an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, two unchanging things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Lay hold, hold fast, in full assurance of faith. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, 
which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. Do you know why you can't let your sin separate you from God and drive you away from God? Because of the promise that he's made to you. You have the confidence expectation that he is going to forgive you of those sins and that he's going to give you a place in heaven with him, right? Don't let Satan get in your head. Don't let him whisper into your ear, oh, you're not good enough. You're never going to be good enough. It's like you sin over and over again. Don't let him discourage you and defeat you, but trust in what God has promised you. It is, it is so disheartening. It is so saddening. It is so upsetting when I hear Christians start to doubt their salvation. You know, you'll, you'll have a brother or sister who will pass away, and they cannot say with any kind of absolute certainty that that person is in heaven with God. It's like, where is your trust? Where is your faith? Are you calling God a liar? Have you, have you devolved to the Pharisee attitude? What, I hope they were good enough, or I hope I'm good enough. You're never going to be good enough. They weren't good enough. None of us are good enough. That's why Jesus came and died on the cross, and God promised us that if we obey him, that if we acknowledge that death, if we're baptized for remission of our sins, he'll forgive us. Brethren, you're going to heaven whether you like it or not. In as much as you've obeyed the gospel. That's not proud. That's not arrogant. That's trust. That's submission to the word of God. That's believing what he has promised and that he is able to keep his promises and willing to keep his promises. To doubt, to doubt that, you really think God's lying to us? Are you ready to stand up and call God a liar? Why are we here if we can't trust that? Are we just here because we're trying to be something we can never be? Good enough? Are we here to rejoice in God's salvation and worship him because of his word? We need to pay attention to God. We need to pay attention to our conduct and our behavior. We need to pay attention to walking in the light. We need to keep his commands. And in doing all those things, we need to always trust God that he's going to save us because of his grace and his mercy and his love and the gift of his son, and the blood that he shed for us. We need to be here because we trust God. Let us hold fast, because he who promised is faithful. And then in verse 24, to these beat-up Hebrew Christians, the writer says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but so much more, exhorting one another. Day approaching. We need to be about the business of encouraging one another, of exhorting one another, of building one another up, to stir up love and good works, to stir up, to get, to get you, right? Come on, Let, let's get to work here. Let's, let's, let's grow. Let's do what we're supposed to be doing. Let, we can't just sit here like bumps on a log. You know, let's put our Christianity into practice. Let's do that. Let's do this. Let's do that. Help me. Let's do it together, right? We'll both get it done. One of the things I always appreciated about Marilyn when she was here with us. Remember how she'd drive around, pass out cookies? 
She'd get people to help her do that. She'd ask people if they wanted to do that. I know that, that Beth and, and Betty encourage one another a lot because they do stuff together. I know that there's a lot of others of you. Say, hey, let's go do this. Let's go do that. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. But one of the ways in which we do that is by not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. We come together and we've got to exhort one another. We've got to build one another up. Do not let our assembly become a place of discouragement, but rather a place of continual encouragement. Right? I have, I have brethren sometimes, and I'll sit there and say, I just don't know what I can do. Yeah, you do. It, it, it doesn't have to be anything big. It doesn't have to be anything great. Write a card. Right? I mean, you've heard all of these before. And I know that so many more of you can do so much more than write a card. Invite somebody over for dinner. You know, go visit somebody. Go talk to somebody. Go put your arm around somebody. Go listen to somebody. Right? Go rake up somebody's leaves. Go dig a trench. Go help them hang a door. Right? Go repair their broken piece of furniture. You know, go mow their lawn. Go take them out to go visit somebody else. There's all kinds of things we can do. You know, there are at least, at least... 62 distinct commands for us to help one another in the New Testament. 62. That's almost as many books as there are in the whole Bible. The New Testament only has 27 of them, but there are 62 distinct commands for us to help one another. I said, you're all the greatest blessing that you've got. I would certainly hope that every single one of us feels that we could turn to any of the rest of us and ask for help with an expectation of receiving it. That's what a congregation is for. It's not the only thing it's for, but that's certainly one of the blessings of it. When we look at that passage, I don't want you to miss the conjunction of faith, hope, and love in this passage. Our assembly is required to build up our faith. It's required to confirm our hope. And it's required to stir up our love. If we forsake the assembly, we're going to die. You can't be a Christian by yourself. You have to assemble with the saints. And you have to do it on a regular basis. We need you. We all need one another. You're important. You're valuable. And you have a great work that God has given you to do and that you can do. Let us help you help us. If you're here this morning and you're subject to that invitation, or you would simply like to... Obey the gospel and join yourself to a congregation of God's children. You can do that by coming forward as we stand and sing. I bring my sins to thee.
Again, good to have uh, everyone here today. And again, our visitors, you're always uh, welcome here. Not a whole lot to announce today. Be sure and check your boxes for the announcements. Uh, it's good to see you guys back that have been on spring break. Uh, good to see Ken and Mary with us today. Alan, good to see you. Uh, let's uh, refer to our announcements in the box as far as people that we need to keep in mind and pray for and such. So thanks today to Craig and our song leader and uh, to our Bible class teachers. Uh, thanks to all of you guys. Uh, the Gaithers tonight at 5.30 is singing. And check the board back there for any meetings in the area. And the duty roster is in the mailbox, so we appreciate uh, Barry's work in that. And of course, we'll meet again Wednesday night at 7. Anything else we need to announce? Okay, let's have our closing prayer. Let's bow. Father, we've been blessed by you this morning. You've kept us safe. We've been able to assemble here without any interference. Father, we've had the opportunity to read your word, to listen to a lesson. And Father, now we're enjoying the blessing of being able to speak to you in prayer. And Father, we know that all this has been made possible by your son's sacrifice. And now he stands, or he sits at your side, and he's our advocate before you. He presents us to you justified, Father, and because of this, we have that hope of eternity with you, and it's all because of his actions. Father, we believe that you watch over us each day and that you provide for what we need in this life, and we know that you control the times and the epics of man, and that you are the ultimate authority. There is no authority except that comes from you. Father, we pray that our worship has been heartfelt this morning, that we've approached you in a proper manner, and that you've heard our words. And Father, as we leave here this morning, we pray that we will have a stronger commitment to serve you in this life. For We believe that you've given us a purpose, and that purpose is, is to bring honor to you. Please go with us now, Father. Keep us safe this week. And Father, help us to look around and see that you're in this world with us, that everything that you've created, and it all comes from you. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>